let me talk about the top four topics that were discussed when Africa is discussed. That is politics, crimes, animal, and poverty. So those were the top four things that people discussed when it came to Africa. Economy was 8%, so business opportunities and investments, that was 8% of the conversation. So that tells us something, right? Um, when, when Africa was mentioned on, um, in scripted shows in America, animals were at the top of that, of that conversation, of those scripts. And um, the other thing was culture, but culture as it relates to um, animals, dancing, things like that, okay? And when it came to, um, again, economy, travel, travel was 5%. When you think about the tourism opportunity in, in, Ameri in, in Africa, and, and we're talking in, 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 in an American environment, when it comes to travel, only 5% of scripted um, shows and, and, uh, and the like talked about travel opportunities to, to, to Africa. Those of us who know Africa well know that this is criminal, right? Because there's so much to see on this continent. Um, the top five countries that are typically mentioned in America are Egypt, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Congo. And I can tell you, being Congolese, that the, the mention of Congo is typically around what I call the three Ds, death, disease, despair. Okay? And then the last thing that I'll mention, um, is 35% uh, of some of the storylines include corruption. Okay, so, so this is the message. This, these are some of the global and, and I dare say local narratives about the African continent. So now we, let's get into a discussion about if we're not happy with that narrative, how we can change it, okay? All right. Um, In the same, so let me ask a question to the panelists. In the same conversation, the former uh, ambassador to South Africa mentioned that um, he had three very sophisticated investors, uh, two who ended up pulling out of an investment that they were going to make as a result of what um, Trump, President Trump mentioned a false story about um, white South Africans being killed in South Africa en masse. And even though these, uh, the, the, again, the former uh, US ambassador to South Africa tried to convince these investors that this story was not true, they decided that it was. And they decided to pull out a, a, a pretty important investment that they were about to make. And so my question to the panel is, how do we fight this? Um, sort of, you know, we, what are the tools that we can use to fight this, this type of, uh, the, the kind of power that um, US media, global media has on how we speak about Africa? Thank you very much, uh, Amini. Thank you for the introduction. Um, actually, I want to go back to like 20 years ago, you know, I am, I'm a strong leader of The Economist magazine. And um, 20 years ago, there was a very terrible article in The Economist. We talked about Africa being the dark continent and that uh, everything in Africa was rubbish. Nothing was good and from Cape to Cairo. And um, is it 15 years later? That was quite recently. Another article came out again. We talked about Africa rising. That was in 2010, actually, Africa rising. When we had the World Cup in, in South Africa. I was actually in South Africa. I was in Port Elizabeth, where there was a match going on. And when I received this document, uh, Africa is rising. And they are, they are talking about you know, some of the good things uh, that happen on the continent. Uh, that uh, you know, Of course, they focus on the diamonds and the gold 
in Congo, you know, those places, they have all these things. They're forgotten about the wars which took place in the Congo, which they orchestrated in the first place. And then um, they came back again, maybe five years later, to reverse this, the, the, the narrative and went back to Africa being the continent of chaos. And of course, recently, uh, there was this controversial talk, you know, by the President of the United States when he referred to, uh, when he made some derogative remarks, well, allegedly, I wouldn't say he made, because I, don't, I was not there. Although he, he denied this vehemently, and he, he denied it, of course, in front of, in the presence of other African leaders who were very angry about it. So, where do we go from here? It's, it, to me, it looks like a back and forth thing. You know, one moment we are, we are going, we are rising, we are going up, another moment we are, we are, no, we are, we are, we are, we are nowhere, or we are in the middle. So that, that makes it very, very difficult for us Africans to, to know, you know which direction to take. You know, the African media too is very, very weak. We have a lot of problems within Africa in the media. There are lots of problems in the area of freedom of expression. Um, a lot of uh, our journalists, I work with a lot of journalists. I have about 1,000 journalists in my network right now as I'm speaking with you, and they're all over the continent. And some of them have been arrested, have been locked up because they've said one or two things, which either the head of state didn't like, or a minister didn't like, or even a director didn't like. So they were just send their, their policemen or whoever it is in the middle of the night, knock on their doors, arrest them. And these things go out in the Western media, and they blow it out of proportion. And they will take it as if that's the only thing that's in Africa. They don't look at the good things that are happening, the developments. And today, what the Western media is doing now, they are focusing on China and Africa. The Chinese investment in Africa is bad for Africa. And that, you know, we are going to owe a lot of debts. Recently, they talk about Zambia, where allegedly they were going to seize the airport or something because the Zambian government couldn't pay some billion dollars debt they owe to China. And, you know, so we are all really, really confused. I think now we have a responsibility in Africa, we as Africans, and actually those of us who are working with the media or work with media people, to reverse this. And also, we have to get our politicians, our governments also, to stop doing some of the things they're doing on the continent, to ensure that, you know, at least there's some positivity going on. Because there are so many positive things on the continent. I, I travel a lot, I go to many African countries, I see a lot of developments, you know. I live in Addis Ababa right now. I used to go to Addis Ababa like 20, 10, 20 years ago. And the Addis Ababa of today, and when I, when I was going there, it's quite different. But these things are never reported in the media. Instead, what is happening in the media is that there has been chaos in Oromia. I live in Oromia, by the way, which is a bit in the outskirts of Addis Ababa. Uh, the Oromos are fighting, the, the Tigres and so on. You know, uh, the new prime minister came, was going to be assassinated. You know, these are, these are stories that we hear. Certainly, thank you. Um, I first uh, would like to... Um Thank Kofi and Philip for inviting me to be part of this very important panel. And I want to thank you all for staying. The hardest part about being a panelist is being on the last panel. <laughs> so thank you all for staying. This is a very, very important topic. Um, I work for Bloomberg, um, and we are a financial information and media company. But we're also a data company, and we're also a technology company. We have approximately seven bureaus on the continent. Our largest bureau is in Johannesburg. And um, I embarked on a media initiative in 2014, in part because, um, and I'm sure my esteemed colleague may have had similar challenges um, at The Economist, but when we were attempting to identify um, journalists, specifically black South African journalists on the, on the continent in, in, in Johannesburg to write business stories for our publications because it's important for us that business stories, financial stories, stories written by Africa, about Africa or by, are written by African journalists. There is an attempt oftentimes for business publications, international media publications to sort of parachute journalists in and out to cover the continent. 
And to your point, sometimes that coverage is skewed and oftentimes is not based on any reality um, or is biased. Um, so we were actually s recruiting uh, business journalists, black specifically, in Johannesburg, and we had challenges. I'm gonna be very candid, because they had not been trained in how to write for business publications. Um, and so we undertook a, an extensive uh, uh, research uh, initiative of about five months in the three developed markets on the continent in Nigeria, specifically Lagos, Nairobi, and Johannesburg to understand if this issue of uh, qualified, skilled business journalists was unique to Johannesburg. And we spoke with editors, journalists, media owners, foundation leaders, civil society, and it wasn't unique to Johannesburg. It is a problem that there are many esteemed and experienced and skilled journalists on the continent who have been trained both on the continent and in the UK and US, but they have not been trained in how to write about your economies, businesses, finance, and this speaks to the narrative that leaves the continent because these journalists are living in, on the continent. They're, they are the ones that are experiencing how their economies are not only affecting international commerce and national commerce, pan-African commerce, but their own pocketbooks. And if they can't, if they can't uh, interpret that, bring it down from that high level, when you talk about GDP, Anything related to economics and finance has to be brought down so that the average citizen can understand it. And so what we have embarked on uh, is an actual postgraduate executive training program for working journalists on the continent. And for the past four years, we have been training working journalists in business and financial reporting. And that program recently concluded in uh, Johannesburg, Lagos, and Nairobi. And due to its success, we are now bringing the program to Cote d'Ivoire, to Senegal, to Zambia, to Ghana, and to Tanzania. Why are we doing this? Because the narrative about Africa is largely a business and commerce narrative. Not entirely, but largely. And if Africans don't understand how to extract that information and make that information public to both national and international investors, you will have a situation where a fake news story about yeah. the economics or the politics or the geopolitical or cultural issues on the continent are being misrepresented. Thank you. Thanks, I think uh, I'll, my contribution to this um, is that uh, the conceptual base or foundation for matters to do with media, communication, and the images of countries, you know, because countries have images just like we have images ourselves as individuals, uh, is that these images are constructed and they are constructed in people's heads, like uh, Walter Liebman, who is one of the theorists in this area, said many years, 1922, I think. And um, the thing is that we might actually blame uh, international media, or global media as we call them, but uh, we need actually to do some self-introspection and uh, look at uh, agency. What are we doing ourselves to be able to construct the image that we think we are, mm -hmm. rather than waiting for CNN, BBC, mm -hmm. CGTN to construct the image of we, uh, who we are. Uh, so in a sense, actually, I wouldn't blame uh, the study you are refer referencing mm -hmm. for, for, for concluding that the image of Africa in US media, UK media, Indian media, whatever other media is largely negative. 
It is not in their interest to construct a positive image of us. It is in our interest, in fact, to do that. Now, um, very quickly, just, you know, there are very many perspectives to this uh, large question. Just one perspective is if you do not uh, plan to develop a good image of yourself, other people will be in charge of your, uh, developing that. Now, let's look at matters policy. And my area of interest is usually media and foreign policy. Now, to start with, the number of African countries that even have foreign policies, you know, written foreign policies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just count Egypt, Kenya, South Africa, and one other. Ghana doesn't have a foreign policy written, and I'm shocking you perhaps. The Gambia doesn't have a foreign, I mean, we are not talking mission statement and vision. Mm -hmm. It's a proper policy that's promulgated. Now let's move from there. Apart from South Africa, which has a public diplomacy and communication, international communication policy. Many other countries do not have that. So that even in places such as Nigeria that are trying to develop an image of Africa through Nollywood, for example, through Afro cinema, they are, you know, these guys are on their own, basically. They do not have the backup of uh, the policy community. Now, look in reverse to the US, for example. We have you know, public officers, public diplomacy officers, we have cultural officers, mm -hmm. we have Fulbright, we have, if you look at, uh, at the UK, you know, the, the government, the state puts money into BBC. BBC is not an innocent, uh, you know, broadcaster that just say, you know, gives, a, you know, balanced information. They infuse a British sensibility into it. So, so, so I think amongst the many other things that we must do, we must go back to the base and say, can we actually start by crafting foreign policies to start with? And can those foreign policies have cultural diplomacy aspects? Can they have national branding agencies and so forth so that then those fits into the images that we want to go into the media to start with? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe what are my contribution will be, uh, I, believe, I mean, I believe it's the same thing when you talk about uh, companies. Um, I think it's, it all starts with vision. Uh, having the vision that Africa should be portrayed in a certain way is the beginning of everything. When you look at America, for example, I was uh, born and raised in Cote d'Ivoire. I did all my studies here, but I was fortunate enough to go to the U.S. for university. And after a few months, you start believing yourself that you are living in the land of opportunity where everything is possible, where you can change your life, where by just working hard, you can get to something for you, for your family. So I believe um, it is the same thing that we need to do ourselves for Africa, whether you talk about individual countries or as a continent. It's about making sure that the young Africans that are today in university, in college, or, you know, or, or even younger than that, believe that here is a land of opportunity and making sure that the same thing applies to people who are living abroad as well. Because Africa needs to be seen differently. Right now, as you mentioned in your study, it's being seen for war, for diseases, and for all the problems. But if Africa is seen as a continent where there's potential, where you can do business, then it changes because investors are looking for ways to generate more value. So if they see Africa as a business opportunity land, they will definitely come and look for these opportunities. And the media, of course, I mean, one, one of my co-panelists uh, mentioned it earlier, they, of course, make sure that they give a sensibility uh, of their own country, of their own part of the world. Uh, some countries have no interest, I mean, do not want African countries to emerge because it will mean that some jobs will be threatened in other parts of the world. It will mean that there will be less resources. Uh, and I believe, you know, I, I saw somewhere that there's no um, friends in, in, in politics. There's only uh, interest. We need to start writing our own story. Uh, I'm into entertainment. I use video games as a way to showcase how Africa could be great. Um, and, and I think there's many other ways and tools that technology or, you know, pro, uh, provides today as a way to change the way people see Africa. And I think you know you were asking how can we change the way people see Africa is by writing our own stories and finding different channels we could use to make sure that people understand it. Entertainment is definitely one great way to do so, but I believe there's many others. Elizabeth, you want to go? Les médias occidentaux montrent euh, l'Afrique sous ses mauvais jours. Nous avons euh, 
l'actualité, des faits comme la sécheresse, les famines, les maladies mortelles, etc., montre une vision apocalyptique de l'Afrique. C'est-à-dire que euh, c'est juste un tableau sombre et fataliste qu'on nous manque de l'Afrique. Mais force est de reconnaître que, outre ce tableau qu'on nous peint, l'Afrique n'est pas seulement apocalyptique, mais elle est aussi un jardin d'Éden. Un jardin d'Éden pour qui Pour nous, les leaders de demain. C'est dans cette vision-là que nous, la jeunesse, euh, c'est dans cette vision, pardon, que nous, la jeunesse, nous devons nous inscrire. Et à dire nous mettre dans cette mentalité. Nous dire que certes, le passé sombre de l'Afrique est passé. Le passé est certes passé, mais l'avenir, quant à lui, il est à notre portée. Mais quelles sont les actions que nous pouvons mener en tant que jeunes pour changer cette vision que le monde a de l'Afrique? Je vais prendre par exemple le cas du programme euh, Souci, Sardar de US Institute. La Côte d'Ivoire, j'ai eu l'occasion, l'opportunité de prendre part, de participer à ce programme en été dernier. Nous étions trois à représenter la Côte d'Ivoire. Il faut dire que la Côte d'Ivoire était le seul pays francophone parmi tous, les, pays, parmi tous les pays anglophones. Il y avait des pays anglophones d'Afrique comme le Kenya, la Sierra Leone, le Libéria, etc. Mais euh, la Côte d'Ivoire était le seul pays francophone. Pourquoi C'est parce que avant nous, toutes les générations qui nous ont, euh, qui nous ont précédés ont ont assuré, si je peux le dire ainsi. Et à part le programme ceci, nous avons encore un autre programme américain où euh, des jeunes élèves collégiens du lycée scientifique sont partis représenter la Côte d'Ivoire. Il y avait des concours de projets et ces jeunes gens ont remporté le premier prix. Je pense qu'en tant qu'étudiant et en tant que jeune, c'est au travers des, des rencontres internationales et intercontinentales que nous pouvons montrer que c'est vrai, vous pensez que ça, mais l'Afrique, c'est pas seulement ça. L'Afrique est très prometteuse. Donc, euh, c'est à travers, au travers de certaines, euh, de certaines rencontres ou euh, des programmes euh, d'échange avec les pays, euh, les pays, on va dire, développés, que nous, jeunes étudiants, nous pouvons montrer nos capacités, montrer qu'en Afrique, nous avons des ressources, non seulement, euh, pas seulement naturelles ou euh, zoologiques, mais des ressources humaines. Nous avons l'exemple de l'INPHB qui est en partenariat avec l'école East Polytechnique de, de Paris. Ça fait la deuxième année, la troisième année cette année, que cinq à, à six étudiants sont choisis après en concours, bien évidemment, pour intégrer ces grandes écoles. Et si chaque année, ces grandes écoles internationales euh, continuent le partenariat et veulent davantage, parce qu'ils augmentent le quota les années, euh, au fur et à mesure que les années avancent, c'est parce que les premiers étudiants qui sont partis ont montré qu'ils étaient à la hauteur des challenges internationaux. Et euh, je pense que c'est ça qu'on attend de nous. Merci, merci. <rire> um. The next question, I think, is also fundamental, and that is, how free is the press in Africa? How many countries to totally have free press, and how many do not? And how does that play in you know, having a really robust discussion about what's happening locally and internationally? So recently, for example, in Rwanda, there's a law that just got passed that said all cartoonists that wrote um, you know, negative, that, 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 sorry, that designed or, or drew, drew negative things about government officials would go to jail and would pay a fine. So, and the other thing is, are we getting, uh, is our press getting freer or less free? And is it, obviously it's per country. We just want to have a little discussion about that because that's, that's obviously very fundamental and it's sort of the umbrella. How free is the press in various African countries? Because uh, I, I didn't finish my first intervention, but uh, in fact, I did mention about the, the lack of uh, freedom of expression in African countries. And that's one of the problems that we have. And that we have all these negative images because of that too. And uh, it's one of the factors that will lead, to, lead us to this negative image. I think um, the press needs to be free. I think we need to get, uh, and that's what my, my, my organization is going to do that right now, the, to, to sensitize uh, you know, African leaders. I mean, we are the African Union, and from time to time we held, we're holding, you know, uh, media sessions for, for African presidents, so that they could, they could sit together and understand what it means to have a free press. And also, we need to train the journalists. Because one of the problems that we have in Africa is that most of our journalists are untrained. You find somebody just coming out of school, doesn't have a job, automatically becomes a journalist, without any training, and writes any, any kind of, whatever, 
he or she can uh, write, you know, for, as a story in a newspaper or on the radio. And that's a very, very huge problem. And that is why we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are finding a lot of difficulties. So if we are, as my colleagues have said here, if we are going to change the narrative in Africa, if we're going to change ourselves, we need to have trained people to do that. Also, we need to sensitize our leaders. African leaders know, should know what it means to have a free place in the country. Because it brings development, it brings investments, it boosts businesses, and so on and so forth. So they, they have to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a very good question. Um, I just want to tick off just a couple of statistics coming off of the data panel, which I thought was so timely. Um, during the past 12 months, the stocks in the emerging markets produced a total return of 3.3%, and from the frontier market gained 3.1%. Among the 26 major African countries, 15 of them beat the above ben benchmark, beat that benchmark with their stocks during the past 12 months. 18 companies in Zimbabwe gained 136%, 11 firms in Ghana increased 44%. 67 stocks in Egypt gained 41%. Nine companies in Zambia produced 19% total return. This is why market transparency is so critical. And governments that continue to engage in the suppression of this kind of information will not develop. They just will not because the investment international and Pan-African community will look for this degree of transparency and that is where their investments will go. So there are degrees of uh, press freedoms, um, but I think that uh, here on the continent, increasingly as the, the, the narrative becomes more accurate, and it is coming from journalists and other uh, uh, people within the media. Uh, and the investment starts to flow to those countries where there is, in fact, market transparency. Uh, that that will be the incentive. Uh, I, I also think that, uh, uh, that the citizenry, the public, uh, will have to demand it and the business community will have to expect it. Uh, yeah, yeah as, so my contribution uh, on this, um, but first, let me just also weigh in on the issue of Africa rising narrative, because I know that uh, issues, we're gonna dispense with it. Uh, and, and just an observation to say that the Africa rising narrative actually was not generated from the African continent. McKinsey Global yes. is the one that produced a report in 2010 called Lions on the Move. Yes. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, they actually marketed it through then, uh, you know, The Economist, Reuters, CNN, and so forth. And uh, this was on the back of the natural resource boom mm -hmm. that we're experiencing, uh, particularly with uh, a very ravenous China coming onto the continent for all, for, for all kinds of ores, mm -hmm. as well as oil and so forth. But in 2014, when uh, then uh, there was a downturn, the Africa Rising narrative fizzled out. We don't hear about Africa Rising narrative anymore these days. Uh, in, in fact, I did a study on this, so I'm familiar with it, um, where I looked at, I did content analysis on Africa Rising narrative in uh, newspapers such as The Punch in Nigeria, mm -hmm. such as, uh, you know, the, the gra new graphic in uh, Ghana, you know, Times Media, Nation Media, and, and so forth. And there was very little mention of Africa Rising. But if you looked at CNN, Reuters, BBC, and so forth, they were really propounding it and saying, you know, look, the, the, the continent is on the move. So again, I think we must just determine that we do not own our narrative and actually look for strategies uh, for doing that. With regards to fresh freedom, uh, freedom I, I think uh, various countries are, are at various stages. And actually, it follows the political system. And I think you just need to look at Freedom House, uh, you know, statistics that come out annually. And you'll find like uh, places like the Gambia, where uh, our colleague comes from, used to be ranked very badly. I think they have improved recently. Um, Zambia under Ango Bob, uh, who recently was forced out, was actually also, you know, doing very extremely badly. 
so, so it will depend with the political leadership in countries. But an interesting development now is uh, your area actually, which is the new media, digital media, social media, you know, arena. You realize in the recent times that uh, Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni and others, actually went on to say, no, look, they are generating a new law to surcharge, you know, social media use actually to tax you are going on to Facebook or Twitter and so forth as a means of curtailing those freedoms. Um, you know, the president of Tanzania, John Pombe Magufuli, who is otherwise known as who? Um, bulldozer, I think, you know, because of his uh, you know, approach, equally has gone on to say, no, look, we'll jail you if you uh, post anything on uh, social media that is uh, critical of, of government. So, so I, I, and I think this is a very tricky area because then it leads us, in a sense, into this fake news, disinformation, misinformation arena vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, verification of news and so forth, which is, a, which is a very tricky area for a continent where freedoms can fall uh, either way very quickly. That would okay. be my contribution. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also want to now bring up the issue of money in the media. So CNN, BBC, all of these international outfits have lots of money. And they can, they, they, the money allows them to, to, do, to, to, to dominate how we think about a lot of things. Contrast that with uh, media in Africa. Last year, um, I had the great pleasure of going to Central African Republic for the State Department. And I had to um, do an entrepreneurial training program with um, a journalist how to churn their, their businesses, their newspaper business, the media business into, into a business. And the common refrain was, Amini, there is no money <laughs> here. Look at the state of our newspapers, even the way it's printed. Um, you know, the, the government is supposed to give us X amount of dollars. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. What is the role of money, Bloomberg, very, very wealthy um, company. Um, how, you know, how can a media house anywhere in Africa compete with a Bloomberg or a CNN and others? So how, how do we fix this inequality and still drive what we are saying, our own narrative, which I think is clearly part of the answer? Um, I'm gonna sort of respond in a couple of ways, and let me just clarify that you're right that our our firm um, is is uh, doing quite well internationally. Uh, it is a limited partnership, um, and we have a foundation, so that the majority of our profits go to our foundation. Um, so, uh, and it allows me to do the kind of work that I'm doing here in Africa to train journalists. Um, just two more pieces of data. Among Africa's 10 major industries, tele telecom stocks outperform, outperform the emerging mar their emerging market peers the most by 6.5 percentage points during the past two years. The market cap of communication stocks in Africa as a percentage of all the African stocks increased 10 percentage points. So there's money in media in Africa and in telecom. What has happened globally, interesting enough to your point, I mean, and I think this is a very important point, is that due to the migration from print to digital, many news organizations, even in the United States, have gone out of business. Ad, ads revenue have migrated to tech, to believe it or not, online. Yeah. But to not media companies, but technology companies. Google, Facebook, they have the market share of ad revenue that used to go to print, to broadcasting, and to radio. So we are in a very challenging time because speech suppression will happen, to your point, not only because some governments are suppressing uh, speech, free press, um, but because the technology companies have virtually become media companies. 
But what has also happened here on the continent and in the United States is that there are business leaders who typically have not been in the media space who are entering the media space. Jeff Bezos is a perfect example. He recently purchased the Washington Post, Strive on the continent, Nick. There are a number of businessmen who have decided that they are going to save media, and they're going to save media here in on the continent and in, 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 in the United States. You look at, um, uh, there, there's just so many of them. Uh, I, I don't want to, to belabor this. But one of the things that technology has brought to the media landscape is the opportunity for people who otherwise could not publish media to now publish media online. And it is not an easy thing to do to monetize that. I will, I will, uh, I will agree with you on that. It is challenging. And one of the things that we have done through our media initiative is with the Ford Foundation, we have established a community media fund. Because one of the interesting things about Africa that isn't as common in the United States is the emergence of community media and citizen journalism. And yes, it has its integrity issues and its reliability issues in terms of content. But to your point, there are these small to mid-sized community-based organizations, particularly in rural and provincial areas, who want to publish newspapers or want to uh, have a radio station and they don't have that seed money. And so what Bloomberg Philanthropies has done in partnership with the Ford Foundation is to establish a fund uh, for community media to help strengthen and help it grow. So it's a very complicated issue, money and media, and where is it coming from and how does it take the, the, the smaller players out? But I think just as technology has been, has, um, has um, uh, created challenges because of the, because ad, ad revenue has left traditional and legacy publications, it has also created opportunity. Can you say something? Okay. Um, I'll say when, 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 uh, on the question on whether there is money in media, uh, I think maybe, my co panelists will probably be um, more suited to talk about it, but I think historically, from my perspective, I think the media industry in Africa was seen, I mean, most of the time, those media houses were uh, funded or started by the government, and the idea was make sure you talk about what the government does and make sure you portray it in the nicest way as possible. I believe that was. Uh, what their job was and, 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 and the transformation of things today uh, leads us into going from media traditional to now media as being a business where media can help talk about politics, can help talk about business, can help talk about entertainment and create value off of it. Uh, I can take the example of the media company in Cote d'Ivoire, which probably doubled its revenues within three or four years because of a shift in the way they were doing uh, things. Uh, in addition to just displaying continuous news, they went into entertainment. They went across the border by showing what uh, Ivorian fiction could be in India or in other countries around the world. And this means that there is potential, there is revenues to be made by the media. It just needs um, people to, 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 to see the opportunities and to go towards where that money could be. And, and, and as far as the change you know, because of technology, I believe technology provides um, great ways for people now to generate revenues. Uh, I could take the example of the telecom space. Uh, I used to be in the telecom space before, where, uh, for example, for one small basic service where we're sending SMS alerts to people, within a matter of three weeks, we had more than 150,000 people who subscribed who were paying a small fee every week to receive news. That was a different way to send out information. I'm not going to say the name of the media company, but it's a major media company worldwide. But they're sending information to people in a different way and generating revenues off of it. So it forces the traditional media to change their strategy and to change the way uh, they, 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 they monetize their information. And I think video, music, and, 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 and everything is, is now very important and should be included in how media are doing business today.
Before we go to question and answer, go ahead and make a comment and then we'll, we'll include the, the audience. Sure, sure. I, th I think very in a kind of a truncated way, uh, it is to observe that there's a colleague of mine here called Gerard, uh, whom uh, today uh, is the only person I've seen, from, uh, is from Benin and a media colleague of ours. He's the only one I've seen with a newspaper today. Uh, if it was in the past conferences, we will have all struggled to get our newspapers so that uh, during tea or coffee break, we look at uh, the headline and, and go in and look. I mean, that's the transformation we've, we've seen. Um, on the continent, we had the continental press that actually failed. If, if some of you who are older uh, will remember United Radio and Television Network Africa, it was called, Utna. Which, which broadcast in both French and English across the continent, but then collapsed. We do recall uh, Panapress, you know, Pan-African News Agency, which was equally continental, was funded by, at some point was propped up by Muammar Gaddafi. When uh, he was sorted out, it was also sorted out, as it were. Um, so, 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 so in a nutshell, this is to say that legacy media, I think, uh, had its uh, day in the sun, and that time has gone, come and gone. However, one of the things that we need to remember is that we are not completely tabula rasa. We are not completely off the radar as far as big media is concerned. I'm thinking here of the group in South Africa called NASPAS, mm -hmm. which is actually ranked about top 10 globally. Mm. Uh, NASPAS, which owns MultiChoice. I think many of you know MultiChoice Africa, you know DSTV. I mean, uh, it, it has um, interest in, uh, I mean, the CEO sits in London. They have interest in India. They have interest in, in, in one of the leading Chinese uh, microblog. It's called Weibo. They have interest in Russia and so forth. So, so on, the, on one level, we have actually some, in fact, when you look at a, a, a group like Nation Media Group in East Africa, it's equally big because it has a presence in Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, you know, their own you know, stuff. So the, I think the challenge there are for, for this, some of these major legacy media is how to, they, they move on to digital platforms. One last point among others um, is that you realize that Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth are actually being taxed in Europe, in the UK, and so forth. But on the continent, we have not yet reached there. Now, this is a very simple thing. You just look at the EU legislation on uh, taxing um, you know, you know, Google and so forth. And let's also tax them at home. Because as you rightly said, I think what a colleague here said, all advertisement is, is, is migrating from newspapers online. And yet we are not taxing uh, you know, these uh, Silicon Valley uh, you know, techies. Thank you. They, they, they've hired a lot of people with, and make a lot of money to fight all of this, <laughs> all this taxing. <laughs> um, before we go to Q&A, uh, and, and I, I'll, I'll just sort of leave it out there. Um, one of the things that if we had more time, and we could talk about this all afternoon, but you know, the, the role of social media, right? Um, we have, obviously we have countries that are trying to stop people from expressing themselves on social media. Um, the role of social media in changing the global narrative on Africa. And you know, we all probably, everyone in this room probably has a Facebook page or a Twitter page or an Instagram. I mean, what, what are we doing on our own, if I could say it like that? Mm -hmm. And then what does that mean collectively about how you know, the narrative of Africa changes? Because ultimately, that's what needs to happen. And also, um, the, the issue of you know, we're, we're at a state of education in Africa conference. What role does, does education play in, in how the narrative changes as well? Um, and, and, you know, and for example, me, I, I'm raising an African child in America, and I, I constantly worry about what I just discussed uh, in this study, and, and because it seeps into her brain, and then she starts to have the same um, vision of, of Africa. So I'm, I have to fight it by making her travel to Cote d'Ivoire, to Senegal, to Congo, so she can see a nuanced, balanced, complex view of Africa. And no matter what I say, I am fighting against things that I, that I can't, there's just too much, right? So, um, and then what are we doing about our young people? Those who live in America and those who live in Africa, those who live everywhere in the world, how are black children looking at Africa and what responsibility do we have as adults, whether you are a parent or not, to make sure that they have a complex, nuanced, 
view of what Africa is about. So I'll leave that out into the, and then let's invite people to. Um, what the African media is so much interested in reporting on. Are we able to use the African media landscape to tell the success story of Africa? And then again, when you enter into the African media landscape, all the pictures that you see, all the images you see, are uh, of the West instead of Africa. Talk about music, dance, our religious programs, festivals, sports, and all the issues about entertainment and social media. Clearly, you get to understand that the African is rather interested in projecting the West. But when we come back to Africa, then we blame ourselves of not being able to, of uh, the West having dominance over the African continent and our inability to project our own selves. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll take about three comments. Go ahead. Abiola, go ahead. Um, thank you for this panel. Um, I have two questions. One's on, uh, with Bloomberg specifically, I know you guys have an African Media Innovative Summit coming up in Zambia, so I you know, thank Bloomberg for all the work you guys are doing. But are you guys interested in also partnering with more localized uh, publishers? Uh, you know, you talk about a lot of talent development. Um, so, so would it be better to, or would it be more beneficial to Africans to help develop the ecosystem uh, by par partnering with other publishers. And then the other question is on revenue models. Uh, you take the Financial Times, for instance. They've got, they've really built a really strong business with over 900,000 paying subscribers. Mm. And so leveraging, you know, the paying for digital media model, uh, how do you see that working with African publishers? Uh, uh, intervene with a much more, perhaps, uh, well thought out uh, contribution. But, but, but I, I think what you're talking about is, um, in terms is, is media flows, uh, and we have what we call contra media flows. I think we had a colleague here from UNESCO who will perhaps remember that whole movement in the 70s and early 80s about Africans and the developing world generally saying, No, look, information flow is largely from the West to the developing world, and we want to reverse that. And uh, for me, it, 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 it seems as if we have. Uh, at some point, we are almost like lost confidence as Africans, and we, we love confidence in ourselves. So much so that, as you rightly say, we are likely to use newswire copy from Bloomberg, or from Reuters, or from Associated Press, or from AFP. But if you are told this is a, a wire copy from a Pana Press, or from a Nigerian newspaper, you say, oh, look, mate, the, the credibility of a Nigerian you know, story is not very high, even for a story that's uh, from Nigeria. So if you're in South Africa and you understand a story from Ghana, you'll go to AP in uh, New York rather than use a Ghanaian source. So I think it's lack of uh, you know, patriotism, lack of self-confidence, and I think this is a political issue. It is, it's a matter that uh, we need to perhaps go back to that, uh, headed, those heady days of Pan-Africanism, of, of the Kwame rumors and so forth, to just kind of you know, reinvigorate us to say, no, let's believe in okay Africa rather than just saying something out of uh, New York is always the best. Yeah. Well, uh, just to add to that also, I'm just, I endorse what you have said, but I think that um, we have a problem. We are not liberated in our minds. We are kind of, uh, you know, under some kind of slavery because we, we don't believe in ourselves, I said self-confidence, yes. We, we always believe that the BBC says the right things or CNN says the right things. I mean, look at our countries today. I mean, in the Francophone countries, they can always go back and connect with France, Franz Van Carter or TV Sink. The Anglophone countries are, are either CNN or BBC or CGTN in English. That's what I've seen. In my own country, I was looking at the television the other day, and I saw that in the news, they would talk about the national news first, and then they connect with CGTN. They used to connect with the BBC. I don't know why they have abandoned BBC now, but it's, it's happening all the time. And how do we, get, we have to get over this as soon as possible, ASAP. I think we need to immediately, you know, disband all these, uh, this, uh, you know, mind, uh, prob mindset problems that we have. And, you know, train our journalists, train them very well, you know, invest in, in media, let our governments, let the private sector, 
let the you know the, um, all the, the telecommunications telecommunications companies in Africa, which are very viable and they are doing very well in most countries, they are making a lot of money. Um, let them invest also in the media. I think that's very very important. We can partner with Bloomberg, for instance, and they can teach us how to do it if we don't know how to do it. But let, we need to allow other media to exploit us and you know mon mon monopolize all the information and you know manipulate it in such a way that we don't believe in ourselves. We think that. We, you know, we are, we, are, we are not good, whereas we are very, very good indeed. We can do things ourselves. Thank you. Let me allow Elizabeth to speak on this, being the youngest member of this panel. <laughs> um, just, you know, how, how are people your age consuming um, news, whether it's local, international, and how African are your sources and how, um, and I hate to say, to use this word, but how, you know, how proud are you to be African as you consume the media um, in, in, in your world? D'abord, merci. Uh, avant de commencer, la chose qu'il faudrait remarquer ou le constat qu'on fait, c'est que les médias en Afrique ne sont pas libres. Et en tant que...